Hey folks, today we're going to talk about intermolecular forces part two, how polar molecules interact with other polar molecules. And there's a lot of terminology, but basically polar molecule one interacts with other polar molecule. And then there's subdivisions, and so you got to watch out. There's dipole-dipole forces, and that's a more generic term, and a more specific term called hydrogen bonding, which sounds like an intramolecular force, but actually it's not a bond like we talk about in Gen Chem 1. Sound complicated enough? I'm going to try to break it down to you, uh, for you, whatever. Let's talk about it now. Well, hi everybody. Hi. Welcome back. Mike here. Today we're going to continue, oh by the way, and sorry for the weird ending, I promise my uh, camera has a full battery, uh, so that shouldn't happen again. Uh, today we're going to continue our discussion of intermolecular forces, and we talked about ionic forces last time, and today we're going to introduce polar molecules. So we're going to talk about the attraction that polar molecules have between ions, which we kind of got done talking about last time, and other polar molecules, including the molecules of themselves. So let's, let's do a little bit of recap, a little bit of review. Even though you've watched my bonding video, let's talk about the classic example of a polar molecule would be the water molecule. And uh, so if you think about it, to look at it in space, think of them as Mickey Mouses. There you go, like uh, oxygens are bigger than hydrogens. So you got an oxygen that's a bigger radius than the hydrogens. And remember, it's a bent shape with a bond angle of about 105 degrees. And because an OH bond is polar, you'll have partial negative, sorry, positive charge on the hydrogens and a partial negative on the oxygen. Partial, so that means not a full-blown positive, negative, positive one, positive two, negative three, whatever, like ionic. And, uh, but there's still charges. And now what happens when an ion comes along? So you could dissolve salt in water, for example. And let's take, uh, it'd probably be about the same size as a, let's say this is an Na+. Plus. Who is the Na plus going to be attracted to? And you'd have to say, well, it's a positive. There would be an attraction with the oxygen because of that partial charge. And if you had something like a chloride, we'll make it bigger and we'll put it over here. Something like that and make it like... There'd be an attraction between a chloride and a water, uh, the hydrogens. So it's kind of funny. I want you to take a look at this diagram that I took from the internet in non-copyrighted form. Uh, and uh, watch what happens if you were to dissolve salt in water. You're going to find out that there's a sphere of water molecules around each ion. Check this out. Okay, now you might have noticed that in the example of the sodium ion, the water molecules are turned around compared to that of the chloride. So the chloride ion would have a sphere of water molecules. By the way, they call that solvation, or uh, they would call it uh, hydration if the solvent is water. So these are just buzz terms. But if you've got a sodium ion just floating around in water, you're going to find that there's a sphere of water molecules around it, and the, the oxygens would be facing the sodium. So, for example, you'd have, you know, here it's a, a oxygens and then hydrogens, and there'd be an attraction there, and they'd be situated that way. And uh, there'd be like six of them. It depends on what size the ion is. Some are too small to fit six. Some have like bigger. Uh, and if you took the chloride, the water molecules would all be turned around, which is kind of just interesting. And, I, you know, so far this is just kind of trivia, but it's just an interesting thing 
that they're turned around. And the real important thing is that there's an attraction there because these hydrogens are partially positive and the oxygens are partially negative. Now, what does that have to do with things that affect your life? Ionic compounds attract water molecules and water molecules attract ions. And so there's, uh, uh, you know, you maybe practically you could say, hey, you ever eat something that's real salty and the next day you're drinking water and that's because water, uh, salt attracts water. There's a whole class of compounds that uh, could be polar or uh, ionic, like, uh, let's take this. In the chemistry field, they call that stuff dryerite. And what we use, it's a desiccant. So this is the anhydrous form, but if you leave it out in the open air, it'll actually snatch water molecules out of the open air. I'm gonna put an X there, uh, saying I don't remember exactly how many water molecules. I, I wanna say it's a five but I'm not ready to commit to that. Thanks, crippling self-doubt. Uh, so what you'll find is that ionic compounds can just snag water molecules out of the air. That's very, uh, that's very useful. Uh, they use that with things that are compounds that are polar as well. Silica gel, little packages of it, uh, wouldn't corrode anything in electronics, so they use little packages of silica gel. That's a desiccant because that has got polar groups on it. So you're going to find that there's this theme that like dissolves like, or like attracts like, and that's charges attract charges doesn't matter where they come from. This is just Coulomb's law that opposite charges attract. All right, so this, if you just always boil down to that fact and you have to understand which kinds of compounds make charges, whether they be ionic or polar, then you're gonna be really, really set in life. Uh, not to mention another example, you ever leave the top off the sugar? Uh, that's a desiccant of a sort, of, that's a pain in the butt if you got like a bag of sugar that uh, gets clumpy and so that's because sugar has polar groups and and water is polar so so I think what we've covered is the class of interactions called ion dipole forces if you've got something ionic and something polar there will be an attraction there whether you're putting the ionic stuff in the water, for example, or whether you're taking something ionic and there's water vapor in the air, these are ion dipole forces. And we're gonna kind of pause on that until we talk about solutions. Why do ionic things dissolve in water? It's because there's these forces. And so uh, we'll kind of leave that hanging. There's not good data here. But next, I would like to talk about polar, polar forces. Right, so let's leave ions behind for a little while and let's talk about polar molecule bumps into other polar molecule. It could be a molecule of the same thing or it could be uh, a different molecule that is also polar. And so here's a little cute little diagram from your book that shows that interaction. Now, once again, what that's going to do is that's going to make these compounds have higher boiling points or melting points, whichever way you want to look at it, because the attractions are stronger. So let's take an example of something that has a uh, polar bond in it. And then we're going to talk about something that frustrates me a little bit, is that there's a subset of polar molecules and uh, or polar polar forces but dipole by the way if you remember back from gen chem one means something is polar it has a dipole moment for example and now let's take something that is somewhat common we'll take the ether molecule so we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, write out the write out the uh, structure of it but i'm going to be really specific with this i'm going to go ahead and put the middle Look from there, looks like the bonding that you find in water. So if you take diethyl ether, 
you're going to have two little carbon chains there. It's a pretty complex molecule, but I want to use it as an example because you've probably heard of ether. And now what we've got is this bond here in the middle is polar. And if you remember your electronegativities, that hydrogen is uh, uh, 2.1 and carbon is 2.5. So that is a nonpolar bond. But this is 3.5 electronegativity. And so this bond here is polar. And so is the one next to it. So you got a little fraction of the molecule that has charges on it. And so let's say it bumps into another ether. And I'm going to try to fast track this by not drawing the whole rest of the molecule. Let's, you know, let's just say that goes on. And so what you've got are charges on that molecule. And that positive charge is going to be attracted to this. So you're going to have a attraction there positive, negative, and that's why this molecule at room temperature is a liquid. As a matter of fact, I want to say that the boiling point of it is uh, <laughs> roughly uh, uh, 30, let's say boiling point is 37 degrees. Fair enough? And uh, I'm looking at my notes here. Now the boiling point, I'm sorry, is 35 degrees. So at room temperature, that is a liquid. You'd have to heat about 10 degrees above room temperature. But we can explain why that's a liquid because it has dipole-dipole forces. Now, I want to be very, very specific here. Uh, there is another kind of subset of dipole-dipole forces that is more specific. So let's say that this is a subcategory of dipole-dipole, but what the books will do is make this a whole separate class. And this is, this is called hydrogen bonding. Now I'm going to uh, I'm going to I'm going to rant for 30 seconds about why I don't like that term. Hydrogen bonding is just really strong polar polar forces. But it's it's been given a different term which makes it sound like something different. It's really not. It's just that these are stronger polar polar forces for a reason. Uh, and I'll talk about what that reason is. So they are stronger oops, stronger polar forces. And they're forces. They're not a bond. So I don't like that term bonding. And I'm, I guess I'm going to blame the biology world for calling it bonding. It's an intermolecular force. It is not a bond like an intramolecular force. So, but it's a slang kind of term, I guess you'd call it. Now what happens is, do you see how that polar bond was buried in the middle of the molecule? With hydrogen, the polar bond is going to always be at, on the exterior of the molecule. So this occurs between hydrogen and oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine. In, in the uh, living world, biology, biological world, you don't see much fluorine. So it's really oxygen and nitrogen. So what I would like to do next is take some data and we're going to compare diethyl ether to water, which would have hydrogen and oxygen. And so what you're going to find out is that polar bond is going to be at the end of the chain. Or say you even had an alcohol. Okay, in your mind, replace that H there with an OH. And what's going to happen is you're going to have the boiling point much higher because that polar bond is on the end. And see, you know from Gen Chem 1 that hydrogen can only bond once, so you can't stick it in the middle of a chain because it'll violate its octet rule. So if you take something like water 
they have polar bonds on the end and there's a big electronegativity difference because in terms of electronegativity hydrogen is kind of a wuss all right so so let's go ahead and take two compounds and uh, I want to compare them so let's take um, uh, formaldehyde this has the formula CH2O and if you go and take a look at its Lewis structure you don't have any this would be dipole dipole this would not be hydrogen bonding because you don't have H with oxygen nitrogen or fluorine and so the result is this has a boiling point of negative 19 degrees C all right, still, you know, it's, it's, it's a gas, and you say, hey, isn't formaldehyde a liquid? I had that in biology. No, that's, that's a solution of formaldehyde in water. So it's a gas. It's, you know, it's not uh, far gone a gas. It's, it's certainly, uh, uh, you know, close to being a liquid. But what you're going to find out is if you go and compare something like water, which we know about, uh, it's going to have, well, hydrogen bonding so really really strong forces you know this this would be partially positive partially negative but it's not a big electronegativity difference like if something was a hydrogen and an oxygen and so you're gonna have a boiling point of 100 degrees C which is really high for something such a small molecule and I'll talk about why the size of the molecule matters next time so uh, what you're going to find is that these are a subset given a different name, which I really don't like about science, given things different names. You know, they're just really strong polar polar forces. And as a matter of fact, just some trivia before we're done here, which we're close to being done. Uh, if you go and take, I'll show you a figure when we're done, biology fans, or not, I mean, all of us have DNA, and you got these I don't have room to draw A's and T's, but you got base pairs. And I'm going to show you a figure right now of if you looked really close at the bonds, like right now. You look at those bonds there you're going to find out that those are hydrogen bonds that keep your DNA zipped together if you did not have hydrogen bonding there the bonds would be let's say you replaced them with something that was dipole dipole they would not be strong enough attractions and your DNA would unzip which would be very embarrassing uh, if your DNA unzips uh, especially if it happened in public uh, okay, so uh, folks, that is a little bit about, uh, first of all, let's recap, dipole ion dipole forces between ions and something polar. Dipole dipole forces in general, which are anything with a polar bond that isn't this category of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, and then uh, a different category altogether, hydrogen bonding which explains why some things have outrageously higher boiling points than they would if they were something similar mole ma molar mass. Uh, uh, for example, if you took an O2, which is nonpolar, that doesn't have a boiling point even close to that of water. So uh, uh, that is a little bit more deep treatment of how polar molecules attract with other polar molecules. So far we've gone over basically four kinds of forces. Ionic, ion dipole, dipole dipole, and hydrogen bonding. And we've got one more to go which we'll talk about next time which is London forces or they call them dispersion forces. Once again they've given them bunches of different names and it's just a bummer. So see you folks next time. Bye!